You're listening to Investify, preaching financial independence and assisting investors to achieve a more flexible and free lifestyle through smart financial planning and real estate investing. If leaving the corporate world and jumping into this thriving industry is what you desire, tune in and listen to stories of like-minded individuals who made the leap to financial independence. Equip yourself with the right tips and tricks to start your real estate journey, making active or passive ventures that are highly profitable and rewarding. What's going on, everybody? You are listening to Investify. My name is Craig Curlop, a.k.a. The Fi Guy, and I'm here with my co-host, Miss Ellie Garson. What up, Woo! Ellie? What's up, Craig? How are you? Good. How are you? I am excellent. Excellent, excellent. <laughs> how, was the, how was the Mrs. Birthday celebrations? Oh, yeah. Thanks for asking. So it turns out that what I thought was a surprise, she already knew about. <laughs> oh, that shucks. <laughs> and I thought that it was going to be the first time that she was going to do it, like the pottery spin wheel thing. And she was like, oh, yeah, I've done this before. I'm like, are you kidding me? How did she know? Oh, how did she know? She needed my desktop computer, like the one I'm at right now, uh, because that's the only one that's connected to the printer. And I was talking to my assistant about setting it up. And that, so that window was up because she never uses this computer. So she read it. <laughs> uh, dang it. Yeah. It's really, really hard to keep surprises, I have to say. So hard. I never once have kept a surprise from her. She always finds out. She always finds out. Yeah, it's really tough. There was, um, but it was fun though? Yeah, it was fun. Good. Good. Uh, one one surprise that I'm like, this is like, this is in my like Hall of Fame of things that I've done, I think, is uh, for, for my engagement with Grace. She had absolutely no idea that this was happening, that I was actually going to ask her. And I had like so many people at this one house that she knew, like all of her friends and her family and all that at this one house. And the whole day we're just like doing all things that in our relationship that was like significant. Right. It was oh. like the first place we went to eat and the first place we met and like all the first hike we went on and like all the things leading up to this this day. And she had no idea that was happening. No idea anything was there. And she was like, there's a hot tub at this place. And she's like, oh, shoot. Like, I forgot my bathing suit. She's like, oh, I guess we can just like go. Right. Like, we don't need a bathing suit. And I was like, no, no, no. Like, we're going to get a bathing suit. Like, right now. Yeah. <laughs> and so, um, yeah, that is, that is funny. But um yeah, just, sorry, just reminded me of that. But yeah, surprises are really, really tough, um, especially when you're so close to somebody. It's, they're, they're impossible, especially with, oh, man, somebody like Brit. I'm like thinking something and she's like, what do you think about? Are you thinking about this? I'm like, how did you know that? You know, yeah. Like, how did you know my birthday <laughs> is coming up in two and a half months? Yeah. It's like she has ESPN or something. Do you remember that quote? Wait, what's ESPN? No. <laughs> it's from, uh, it's from Mean Girls. Oh. It's, it's like she has the ESPN or something. <laughs> Dang, I have to look like, rewatch Mean Girls. Apparently, there's a lot of quotable things in that movie. It's the only movie that I quote. So, <laughs> well, speaking speaking of Mean Girls, uh, we have Mr. Darren Bloomfield on the show, which has nothing to do with Mean Girls, by the way. But he's the nicest guy. <laughs> but he's actually like the nicest guy, and you'll find out why if you listen all the way to the end, and why I'm kind of a jerk sometimes, and why Ali is a little bit of a jerk, but Darren is not. If you listen to the end, you'll get why. Uh, and so with that being said, why don't we get Darren onto the show? This episode of Investify was brought to you by the FI team, a team of investor-friendly agents that service all 50 states. If you are looking to house hack, to invest, grow your portfolio, and want a true investor-friendly agent on your side, go to thefiteam.com and click get started. And we can't wait to have a good conversation with you. And Darren Bloomfield, welcome to the show, my friend. How you doing today, dude? Woohoo! Good, Craig. Good. Thanks, Ellie. Thanks, Craig, for having me on. Uh, good, beautiful day out here in Chicago. Nice summer weather rolling in. So happy to be here. Wow, they have they have beautiful days in Chicago. I didn't think I thought that was against the law. 
it's it's maybe like a three month span. I'm in Chicago, born and raised for me, so living in Chicago now. Um, but yeah, like May, June, July, uh, go to the lake or the beach. Uh, definitely good scene. But yeah, don't try not to come during the winter. It snows a lot and it's very cold. Yeah, man. I, I did a six month internship in Chicago when I was in college, and I used to go to Oak Street Beach a lot. So you probably have been there, and uh, definitely, uh, it's a fun a fun spot if you want to sneak beers in and drink while everyone else is. You're not supposed to do that, I guess. They started to crack down when, when we were in high school. So I, I don't know how long ago that was. But yeah, the, the police would like to wait. Um, but they would forget that there's two two entrances to the beach uh, versus the one that they would just stand on. So. Nice. Yeah. Awesome. Loopholes. Nice. All right. So we got beers, we got beaches. And next, we're going to talk about real estate. And so, Darren, why don't we why don't we transition a little bit and tell us how you first heard about financial independence, real estate and all that good stuff? Yeah, definitely. I mean, I, I always was kind of financially savvy, like throughout college, just uh, like investing, you know, in stocks um, and just kind of being aware of just the very bare basics of like, you know, uh, spend less than you earn, invest a difference, kind of that stuff. But yeah, I think a good way to answer that question, I actually went back through like my Amazon orders, uh, like what books I was ordering. And so Rich Dad, Poor Dad, everyone's favorite. So I ordered that in June of 2022, June of 2020. Uh, so I think that was just, I, I'm not really sure why I bought that book or where that came from, but that was maybe like just uh, the seed was planted when I was in college, but I don't really think I got, you know, more intentional until probably like May, uh, 2022. Um, I bought a book by JL Collins, had a couple good books, uh, the, uh, simple path to wealth and then he actually wrote a book about how he like lost a bunch of money on real estate so that was kind of like his mm -hmm. cautionary story and i bought uh brandon turner's how to manage uh, the rental property mm -hmm. um so that was definitely some great tips before i kind of entered the space so yeah i'd say around may uh 2022 and i graduated college in december of 2021 okay so nice. you're, you're a spring chicken you're a young guy a little bit bad. Yeah, I feel like a boomer saying spring chicken, but um, I'm not a boomer. My parents are just barely boomers. So, so, so uh, May of 2020 is when you is when you bought Rich Dad Poor Dad, and it took you about two years while you're kind of in college slash just out of college to kind of just get educated. Were you just reading the books, listening to the podcast, and just kind of getting comfortable? Is that what took you that long? Yeah, I mean, I think I didn't really think about buying any real estate until like after I graduated college really um and I think at that point it was really just I graduated and I was living at home for a few months uh just starting a new job um and it just kind of made sense uh, to live at home just kind of a in Chicago cl close train ride to downtown so it just kind of made sense to live at home for a little bit um and then I just realized you know hey you know I have to live somewhere I don't really want to go rent um and then thankfully, I kind of found the podcast and the books and bigger pockets. And of course, you guys, just before I was kind of making that decision to buy something. So like I didn't buy the condo. Um, I didn't buy something just to think I would, you know, live there and not think about what would happen once I would move out. So I think around that point, um, yeah, and in like May 2022, kind of got more comfortable. Um, I think that we kind of talk about like the, the 500 hours of like self-education kind of content before you can kind of kind of get comfortable with the idea of like becoming a real estate investor. So I definitely put that time in, kind of tried to build a network. Awesome, Darren. And, and so I guess, what did you, what did you go to school for? What did you graduate in? What's your job, you know, coming out of school? Yeah, definitely. So I, I went to Butler University in uh, Indianapolis, Indiana. So I studied uh, risk management, insurance and finance. You sound like a fun wow. guy, man. <laughs> well, that's the thing. I think insurance kind of gets like a bad rap. Uh, you know, you say insurance, a lot of people think like personal lines, you know, auto and home, mm -hmm. nothing against like people who sell it or like life insurance, but there's, there's, you know, insurance or businesses, obviously. So I work in that space right now. Mm -hmm. uh, so I'm very heavy in like financial statements, uh, who owns the company, is it, any bankruptcy risk are they able to refinance their debt um just saw like ownership structure and stuff so yeah i just look at excel a lot and audit financials uh, so it's called like directors and officers and uh, like employer practice liability 
That's interesting. That's super cool, man. And I, I make fun of you just because I was also a finance guy too. And everyone, and I was drowning in spreadsheets back. Nerd. Yeah. And everyone would call me a nerd. So now I feel like I have to retaliate. <laughs> but you had it bad. So they have to make it bad for others. Yeah. I gotcha. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. Yeah. We don't make it better. Right. That, that's not how life works. Um, but, but Darren, so, but it sounds like, you know, you, you probably strategically went in to college with this degree not because you love insurance and you love that, but because you knew that you probably had high odds of making decent money when you graduated. Right. Uh, and so like, you know, if you, if you don't mind sharing, like how much did you make when you were graduating? It sounds like you moved back home to Chicago, lived at home to save on expenses. And so like, how much were you making and how much were you spending on a monthly basis when you graduated? Yeah, definitely. I mean, like starting salary wise in insurance, uh, say around like 65, 70 K, uh, so pretty high salary. And, uh, yeah, I mean, I think just in college, like doing the networking, getting the internships, getting the best job, just kind of like that uh, path. Um, and then, you know, starting to work. Uh, but as far as like how much was I making, how much was I spending? Um, I, mean, I was living at home for like six, seven months, like saving up money for a down payment. So not much expense there. Uh, so that was obviously beneficial to save. Yeah. I always, I always say that it, if I hadn't joined the military, I would have done the same thing. Like, cause I got started with the VA loan. So it's a no brainer, you know, like no down payment. It's super easy to get in. If I didn't have, you know, the ROTC scholarship with the military commitment after I would have done the same thing, graduate college and go back with my parents for a year while I save as much as I can. I know that they would have happily had me. Um, who knows how happy I would have been though, but, but Hey, I would have been saving money. So that's awesome. Mr. And Mrs. Gar said, I hope you're not listening to this. Allie would be very happy if she came back home. Yeah. Totally stoked. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Darren, like, I think, I think it's kind of like a, you're kind of swallow a humble pill a little bit. When you go back home with your parents, you've got a good job. There's no reason really why you need to be living at home with your parents. All your friends probably weren't living there. And after four years of being away from your parents, it is really hard to go back. And so yeah. kudos, kudos to you. honestly. I have a great relationship with my parents and I don't know that I could have gone back. Also, I live in like a small town in Massachusetts. So there's another reason where I probably can go back, but no, I think Darren, I think you made that sacrifice. I think everyone's got to go through. I opted to live behind a curtain, right? You opted to live at home with your parents. Everyone's got to make that sacrifice. And so uh, how much did you save in that seven, eight months? Yeah, probably North of like 10 K. Um, and I had, you know, some money saved up, uh, just throughout like college. Uh, just, you know, investing in some stocks and doing like some like high yield savings accounts. Uh, so maybe like 20, 25K before I like bought my house for the down payment. Um, but you always need more money than you think you would need when you're trying to buy your first house, I guess. Yeah. Yeah. What do you mean by that? Like how, how much did you think you needed and how much did you need? Yeah. So when I was buying the property, I was using an FHA loan. So I kind of knew going in as far as like running numbers on Zillow, like kind of estimating like an interest rate, I would bump it up, put it a little like higher mm -hmm. than I thought I would get just to kind of have some cushion. And then uh, just as far as when I identified the property that I was wanting to buy. Uh, so for FHA, I can just do a quick one through. So it's a uh, your income plus 75% of the possible rents of like the, the unit that you're going to rent, at least for like the two flats, I think three and four flats get a little more technical with like self-sufficiency and that stuff. Uh, but the appraiser came in and they underestimated, like right now I'm renting the first floor unit for 2,100 a month. And I think the appraiser came in and said it was only worth like 1,600 a month or like, or 1,500 a month maybe. So there's obviously like a big gap so I had to buy down the interest rate. Mm -hmm. um, so right now it's nice because I'm at like a 4.125, but I did have to like come up with like an extra like 10,000 I was going to use towards the renovation uh, to close. So I was definitely like kind of stressful. Yeah. Allie, you know what it sounds like we're kind of getting into here? This sounds like we're already in the, the, for, the for real deal. 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 All right, Darren. Um, and I think that was a little bit on me. I kind of had you jump the gun a little bit because I was just so eager to get into your first deal. But this is basically the first thing you ever do. It's what makes you like a for real investor. And so why don't you tell us a little bit about, you know, again, we'll kind of start from the beginning about, you know, how did you buy the property? How did you find the property? What kind of property was it? Price, rent, rehabs, all that good stuff. Yeah, definitely. I mean, I think it kind of starts 
first of like seeing yourself kind of as an investor, you know, talking to people kind of in, in the area that you are, like I actually met my real estate agent, like at, at my church. Um, and then he uh, had like the attorney, it was also at my church. And then I think just kind of building your team like that. So I found it on the MLS and, uh, yeah, so it was a two flat, I think I negotiated down, got some closing co- closing cost credits uh, as well. So I think I ended up at like 494 with like a 15K closing credit. Um, so that was like a $3,400 mortgage. Okay. For us non-Illinois, Chicagoan people, a two flat is just a duplex or? Yeah, du- duplex, yeah. Okay. And does a flat mean it's like a top bottom duplex or is it side by side? Yeah, yeah. It's uh, up, up and down. Okay, so up, down, duplex, side by side. You bought it for four ninety four with fifteen thousand in concessions. Did you use the FHA loan? Yes, I did. Yeah. And so you put down how much? Um, I think like ten or fifteen, and then the additional uh ten to buy down, buy down the rate. And how long were you looking? Uh, because you said that you found this on the MLS. How long were you looking on the MLS before you found this one? And what were your, what were your requirements? Like, what were you looking for? Yeah, definitely. I mean, I, I'd say maybe like three to four months of just kind of on Zillow doing like once you kind of get the pre-approval, you can kind of quickly see what neighborhoods in Chicago you cannot buy in. Mm. And then, I mean, that's obviously like closest to the lake, close to downtown is obviously like very, uh, you're just priced out. And then, uh, I mean, I had some sort of, you know, home field advantage as far as being in the city, kind of knowing the area. So, I mean, for me, um, like my buy box criteria, I wanted to be by a train uh, to get downtown. I wanted to be by the highway and just kind of, you know, younger guy, like 23, just kind of wanted to have some sort of like social scene. Mm-hmm. And I kind of thought like if this is a place that that I would want to live in, then then I'd probably track the similar tenant pool, which which is what I did do. Um, so that I, I worked out great. Awesome. And so you said your monthly payment was like 3400 yeah, and then property taxes came in and went up like fifty two percent. So now we're sitting at three thousand six hundred. Dang. Okay. Yeah. Thank you, Chicago. Yeah, that's what you get, man. Living in the city, big city. No, so thirty thirty four hundred uh, when you're first coming out with it. Um, and so, like, let's kind of analyze those numbers as if you were just buying it today. You didn't know those properties were going taxes were going to increase. And so, you know, what you said you're renting the top the top floor out for twenty one. Yeah, so twenty one, um, and then the floor I'm living in, um, I'm living in. So, so they're both two, two one, two ones, so two bed, one baths. Uh, but then also the the water bill, which I'm also paying, is is two two twenty. So that's monthly as well. So I'd say, um, before property tax went up, let's say like three thousand six hundred uh, water bill and DITI, and then I was renting the first floor for two thousand one hundred. Okay, cool. And did you have a roommate or anything else in your place? Not right away. I did start doing like Airbnb, like the private room. Uh, so I was renting out one of the bedrooms in, in my unit starting like in November, like end of November. How did that go? How was renting out like a private room? Yeah, I mean, it worked out well. Um, the first guest was probably my worst. Uh, but after that, things <laughs> things have worked out the kinks and just kind of got, you know, more used to it, I guess. I mean, it's, I mean, it does help to, have just kind of like that mindset from like the podcast and the books of like housing is an expense, housing needs to be minimized, uh, like housing costs should be minimized. So I think that kind of made me like more comfortable. And then also like on the tax strategy side, that kind of helped me because I, I did my taxes uh, last year as like uh, three fourths. Uh, so like three of the bedrooms out of four of the bedrooms mm-hmm. was like investment properties. So that kind of helped me when I was doing like my renovations and kind of anything like outside of the property. Interesting. And what do you mean by that? Like on the depreciation front or? Like any repairs um, that I did uh, to the property and I could do like the write off at 75% versus just like, you could do like square footage, I think, mm-hmm. or you could do just like 50% or however you want to do it. Nice. And you also, so you mentioned uh, not knowing the future as far as like the tax is going to be, how they increased on you. So that was a lesson learned. What other what other lessons did you learn in buying this first property? Yeah, definitely. I mean, as far as like the analysis paralysis, just leading up to like actually buying it. But once I bought it, 
I think it's just kind of the realization of like, you know, real estate's a team sport. You, you cannot do it alone. Uh, and then as far as like finding contractors, getting referrals, uh, going to like meetups, like in, in Chicago in the community, like, I think that was definitely really helpful. Like some, some of the real estate agents I've met, like referred me to their contractors. Um, and then like, obviously without them, like I couldn't have, you know, finished the rehab on my, on my unit upstairs. Yeah. What kind of rehab was it? Yeah. So in my unit upstairs, I did a kitchen rehab, bathroom rehab, um, all new paint and, uh, the interior of both units and, uh, yeah, all new, the vinyl, uh, flooring. And then I, so originally when I bought the house, um, it was like shared utilities. Mm -hmm. So no central AC and it was like a shared furnace and a shared water heater just in the basement. So I installed a water heater and furnace for my unit. So separated utilities and I put an AC um, as well and just in my unit. Nice. And how many like contractors did you have, or did you have more than one contractor walk through it to give you bids? Yeah, definitely. More than one contractor. Um, some some guys obviously could do multiple jobs. Uh, you know, they could do the kitchen install and the bathroom install and and some of the flooring. Like it's guys like that, um, definitely make the process like easier, especially if they're you know more impress, investor friendly. Um, and then yeah, I mean just kind of like finding contractors like uh, like like Thumbtack is a good app that I like use. I don't know if you heard of it. Uh, so I found like the guy who's doing my fence on Thumbtack. Um, and I put gutters on my garage and I, I found that guy walking around Menards. So <laughs> nice. nice. Is there a grocery store? <laughs> it's like, like Home Depot and like Menards. Oh, okay. 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 That's awesome, man. And I think there's a, um, way back in the day, I don't know if Jay Scott still gives this advice, but Jay Scott, who was a bigger pockets guy, always suggested that like go to Home Depot or Lowe's or, or Menards at 6 a.m. to find all the best contractors because those are the guys that are up. Is that something that you did or were you just like a, a 1030 kind of guy? <laughs> well, I think it was just kind of, I mean, no, I, I wasn't really going at 630, but yeah, I, I like during the rehab process, I would usually like pick up all the materials and pick everything out. So I was going to Menards, like two Menards, home Depot, maybe like two to three times uh, a week at least. So I think just like being friendly, uh, talking to like the workers, just kind of, like, oh, do you guys invest in real estate, yada, yada, just kind of getting more of a lay of land and just kind of being more like aware of like my environment, who who was there, like this guy was wearing like a, a hoodie with like a property management like company on it. So I just kind of asked like, oh, you clean gutters, do you do you install them too? Yeah, that so you had a couple of recommendations already from other real estate investors. And you went with one that you found that you had a, developed a good relationship with at Menards. Is there a reason that you went, that you went with that one and not one that came recommended? Yeah, I mean different different jobs, different people. Mm -hmm. Um so I think this was just kind of more like opportunistic. Like I'd say I maybe have worked with like five or six contractors like at least uh thus far, but yeah, I think it's it's good to have more than one person like familiar with your property, uh, more than one person that you can trust and then it's also like great when they can like do you know, multiple things like they can fix this lock, they can help with the leak, just kind of general like property uh, upkeep. Yeah. Let's talk about the numbers of that rehab. Yeah, I was just about to get into that. Spill the tea, Darren. How much did you spend on it? Yeah, I'd say the kitchen labor and materials was probably around like uh, 10 to 15. I think bathroom was a little over like five uh ac on uh, furnace probably around like eight and then uh, water heater uh labor materials probably around like three um i also had to do like a new chimney oh so this could be like a lesson during like the inspection period is uh so i had a new furnace and like you know we inspected everything but the furnace was like two years old but it wasn't hooked up to a liner in the chimney so then it started kind of leaking, um, like in my unit down, down a wall a little bit. So then I was like, what is going on? Um, why is this happening? Uh, what do I do? Um, and then, then I got a new chimney, uh, but then the chimney guy's like, yeah, you also need a liner. So that was like another like 5,000 right there. 
Wow. So what does that mean? Like it was, was it water leaking down or? Yeah. So it was kind of, so like where the wall is at the bottom where like the trim is, it was kind of like this sappy kind of like, I mean, it was like kind of like, I think dirt because above my unit is like an attic. So I think it was just kind of like dirt or just kind of condensation uh, mixing and kind of just dripping a little bit, I guess. Um, so yeah, I, I think I'm lucky enough to like catch it when I did before it became such like a major issue. Wow. Okay. Santa, Santa messed that up when he went down your chimney. That's right. Yeah. Maybe he had one too many cookies and over over stuffed himself down there. Okay. So yeah, that's a good, that's a good thought is like, you know, make sure if you've got a chimney, I think it's always good to get your chimneys inspected. If you've got one, um, a fireplace or whatever, like get that whole house inspected. If you're buying a 200, 300, $500,000 purchase, like make sure spend a couple thousand dollars to get all the, all the inspections done. And so, so Darren, it sounds like you put about 35,000 total into the one unit. It was that, was that, did you redo both units or was it just the one? So on the, the unit downstairs was pretty turnkey. I think I just swapped out like the tiles and the bathroom on the floor and then just a fresh coat of paint. But besides that, um, not much work went into the first unit, thankfully. Nice. Okay. So I was kind of just doing the math in my head as you were saying, spitting out the numbers in it. So it probably surmounts to about thirty five, forty thousand dollars $40,000 total in the rehab. How did you come up with that money? Because it didn't sound like you had a whole lot coming right out of college and all that. Were you just saving like crazy or... Yeah, definitely saving and then uh, just kind of access to capital wise of uh, what what like what kind of capital can I get as far as like business cards. Um, I, w- I went down that rabbit hole of getting kind of like the Amex zero uh, percent sign on bonus like summer for six months, summer for twelve months. So I kind of staggered that throughout the process. Mm. Um, and then with like the the Airbnb being uh, that that other bedroom i was able to you know cut my expenses even more which definitely helps put more money towards it uh but then you know it's kind of hard as far as like some contractors only really want to be paid like cash or like a check or they'll charge kind of like a fee uh to use the credit cards and you got to pay them cash but then when you're at like menards or home depot then you can you know use your credit card so it's kind of um just however you can really get the job done i mean i think that if you believe in the property that you 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 bought and the neighborhood that it's in, and as far as like the value add opportunity, like I don't think I over renovated my unit, so I was confident putting a substantial amount into it. Uh, as far as like increasing the rents and hopefully at some point being able to add that value and access that that equity if I'm able to or when I'm able to refinance uh, in the future. Just, just real quick on like the, the psychological stuff, like people are scared, right? To, to invest money they don't have and take out credit cards in order to do the rehab. Like if you had to do it, to do it all over again, would you, or were you scared? Yeah. I mean, it's kind of hard to keep spending the money, right? As far as like, you need to have some sort of plan or other access to capital. Uh, I mean, like I might not have had you know, 20, 30 K cash, but yeah, I have money in a 401k. I have money in Roth IRAs. I have money in post-tax brokerage. So obviously that's not like great, especially now to like sell stocks at a loss if you have to, or like do a 401k loan. Uh, But there's things that you can do. So, I mean, it's not like I only had, you know, like a thousand dollars to my name and I put, you know, 20, 30 K on like credit cards. Uh, That would, absolutely like terrify me I, I don't think i would do that but i think kind of the way to look at it for me now is i'm living in a nicer property and uh right now it's like i know how much the rehab costs so it's kind of interesting in a way of like i'm saving to pay for the rehab but i already like paid for it if that makes sense like, i'm saving to pay off the credit cards but i already can enjoy like the property now right right you're, you're enjoying the property you get you get the you get the benefits of the rehab you get the increased rents you get all that stuff and now you're just paying back the loan you know it's probably and i always think it's better to do these things earlier rather than later because prices always go up right like contractor prices labor materials all that stuff i remember sorry I'll give you a little story i had to put in a total of three egress windows in two prop in two properties 
And I was like kind of just kicking the can down the road and I had done it for about a year and a half, two years. And I was like, man, like, I just feel like these prices are going to go up. And my egress window gave me, guy gave me a pretty good deal. He said, he'll do all three windows for nine grand. So $3,000 a window. And nowadays it costs like five grand a window or something crazy. Like it's price of almost doubled. And I'm just like, I'm so glad I had that like discernment to just act sooner and knowing that the prices were going to go up and they went up like the next year. So good on you, Darren. Yeah. Yeah. I found, I found something similar with my roof. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, I'd say also something I learned is like it's hard enough to find a contractor and, you know, have them like show up consistently. So I think once I like was introduced to a contractor who could do the kitchen rehab, who could do the bathroom rehab, like I I just kind of in, in life, like I never really want to be the person that's like holding something up, you know, whether it's like an email for work or like calling this person or kind of like being the bottleneck. So I kind of saw the opportunity of like, let's just get it done. And I'm, I don't know if either of you have prob- probably though, like just living in like doing a live in flip, if you will, like living in your property when you don't have a kitchen for like a month, a month and a half, like a fully operating kitchen, like that's hard enough, like mental health wise. So just kind of like get it, get it done and just kind of move on. Uh, and I think it's definitely like a major confidence boost too, as far as like getting into the property kind of having like your plan for what you can do with it seeing that potential for value add and then executing the the plan um especially like going from zero to your your first property i think that that's a huge confidence boost yeah especially if you're going to be doing rehabs and all that too talking to contractors managing it that's yeah that's that's awesome i i'd like to talk about the schedule of the payments for the contractors you had a couple. So what, what did that look like? You know, cause some, some contractors want 50% up front. Some are cool with only 25. Um, you know, some want multiple throughout the project. How did you work those out with the contractors? Yeah, definitely. I mean, contractor by contractor, project by project, just for like a rundown. Um, I like my bathroom and kitchen, I did separately, maybe like a few weeks apart. Uh, So I think it was the same guy who did that. So I think maybe like 50% down. Um, And I know some people might say that's like a little high, but as far as like getting the referral, knowing um, like the agent who referred him is also an investor. So that was just kind of like confidence wise. Uh, And then my AC and furnace, I did 75% down, which again, a little higher. Uh, But I realized that... uh, you know, this contractor was able to come in, you know, several thousand lower than my other bids and also referral from a real estate agent from um, a plumber too, who, who did my uh, water heater installation. Uh, Yeah, it's like really cool once you kind of find like that team, like that group of Oh, like I'm working this with one contractor. I point out this electrical project I need done. He's like, "Yeah, call this guy," and then you call him, and and then like, like it's just kind of really nice to have the answer. <laughs> yeah, it just kind of have that connection and just have that flow of having some sort of uh, like relationship without really knowing exactly who they are. It just kind of it just kind of makes the the job easier and just goes goes quicker and more smoothly yeah just knowing the one right person will like unlock a whole network of people that are reliable so that's 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 great i i found so so with yours you one of them you did 50 percent. so were there two payments and then the other one you did 75 percent. was it just like the initial and then the end yeah okay nice so were you were you comfortable giving 15 75 percent up front yeah i mean i guess so as far as like it just kind of seemed to be how they did business, right? And I, I think I already was getting like a fair enough price and they seemed like a reliable contractor. Then again, that, that I had connections to, that I knew that they were doing business well. I mean, even though it was my first time working with them, like I knew two or three other contractors and like a real estate agent that was like using them actively. So I... I felt more confident but yeah i mean like you hear people like skipping town and stuff so thankfully i I didn't have to experience that 
Yeah. Yeah. Actually that happened to, that happened to my wife. Uh, yeah, she gave, I think like 50% upfront to just to somebody that did not come recommended, you know, just to cut down a tree, small project. Um, he's like, Oh yeah, sure. Well, first I need to buy this tool and then I'll come back. He never came back, you know, <laughs> like, but anyway, what I was going to say was, um, it, and everything is negotiable, right? So like, even if that is, even if someone comes recommended and by either other investors or an agent, um, even if it seems like that contractor, that that's the way that they do business. If, if you're going to be giving him or her repeat business, then I think it's worth asking to something to work something out to where you feel more comfortable. For example, I, when I did my first rehab, it was here in Tucson and it came recommended by a lender that I trust. Um, and he was like, and out of all the contractors that I, um, had come over and provide me a bid, that one was actually came in the lowest, which is usually what they say is like, don't, don't go with like the lowest contractor. So like all the red flags were there, but because he came recommended by a lender, um, I, I trusted it. And I saw that the work that they, that they did on, at that lender's property. So when we met, he was, he pretty much did business like 50% upfront, um, uh, for him to pay for like the materials and whatnot and everything. And then 25 and then 25. So, but I told him, I was like, Hey, this is my very first rehab. And I know that, you know, the lender and like, I, I will be giving you repeat business because I am a realtor and I know people that need, you know, future rehabs to be done. I don't feel the most comfortable putting 50% down up front. Can we do 25? And you can tell he kind of like hesitated, but he was like, you know what? Again, because of that referral, he came recommended. We knew people in common. Um, we were able to do something that he doesn't normally do. So you're able to do like 25 and like just random ones. We had like a multiple, like more than four payments. Um, so it was like 20, 25, whatever. And I, I purchased the materials too. Um, but again, it was like my very first rehab. I was like, so scared. <laughs> so I was like, what can I do to make myself feel more comfortable as long as I keep him and he's happy. And then I paid him, you know, extra for finishing earlier than what we, uh, established. So everything's negotiable. Like you don't have to do 50% up front. Um, I sometimes feel like it's a red flag. If the contractors say, no, nope, this is the only way I do business, you know, take it or leave it. I don't know. It's, it varies, I guess, contractor to contractor. No, I think that's, I think it's, I think it's really good. Ali, it's good on you to like have that coverage to say that to a contractor, especially your first time. I was, uh, Darren, I'm, I'm more similar to you too. Whereas like if someone comes recommended, I'm just going to like go, go with what they say and like kind of hope for the best. And, um, thankfully that hasn't really come back to bite me. Right. Just as it hasn't you, but it certainly could. Right. And so I think it would be good practice just to be like, definitely for me, like the 75% would make me a little uneasy. 50% seems to be pretty common, but if you just say, Hey, I'll buy the materials and give you 25%, that sounds, that sounds reasonable. Right. And they'd probably even be happy with that. Um, awesome. Darren. We hope this episode is inspiring you to take action. If you're thinking about becoming a real estate agent or an agent who wants to join an investor-friendly team, just hit me up on Instagram at the Fi Guy because we are growing our team in Denver, Seattle, San Diego, and Coeur d'Alene, Idaho, but also adding to our network in all 50 states. And if you didn't already know this, the Fi team provides a super supportive environment with one-on-one -on -one coaching, accountability, and ongoing training to help develop kick ass rock star investor friendly real estate agents so hit me on up on instagram at the fi guy shoot me a dm and we'll set up a time to chat can't wait to chat with you so enough about us let's talk about you um so this property now it's all rehabbed you know um now are you still in that property today yeah i'm in it right now yeah. okay so what is it kind of like give us the the new numbers you mentioned the taxes went up and, and all that kind of stuff so what's the new mortgage payment if, you know, after the rehab, the rents and all that? Yeah, definitely. So mortgage payment right now, uh, 3,600, a uh, water bill, like 220. And then I'm doing Airbnb too. So I just kind of throw in my like utilities as far as like the, the heat bill, the electricity and kind of Wi-Fi. So I'd say total cost around like 4,000 a month. Okay. And then, and so how much is that Airbnb making you? Yeah, I'd say like sixty to seventy dollars a night. Uh, right now we're in like the busy season as far as like Chicago summer weather. A lot of people are like coming, trying to you know look for their next uh, apartment or just kind of staying here for a few days uh, when they transition. So 
pretty profitable, I'd say. Okay. And like if you if you had to guess on like a monthly basis, what would you say it is? Yeah, I'd say in May I think I made like two thousand dollars. Um and I think in so far I'm booked out and summoned to like August and I think it's at like expected earnings at like seven seven thousand for twenty twenty three up until like August. Okay, nice. So so this thing is doing pretty good for you. I've been making you two grand plus your other your other unit is making you still 2100 or were you able to increase the rents at all since you bought it? Um, not yet. I mean, I've only been here for like six or so months, so I think their lease would expire soon. I think there is definitely potential to raise the rents. Like sometimes I would look on Zillow and kind of see like there was a house across the street that was a little more updated than mine. Uh, but I think that was listed at like 2,500 for a two bed, one bath, similar square footage. So I think there's definitely room uh, to boost the rents. Uh, but yeah, I think it's definitely also important to have like a good tenant, you know, in place as well. Yeah. Awesome. So, so, I mean, it sounds like you're living pretty dang close to break even at least in Chicago, which is, you know, kind of tough thing to do for most people living in Chicago. I mean, you're, you're 23 is what I think you said, maybe you're 24 now. Um, but either way you're young and I suspect your tenants are probably older than you. And so is what, is there any sort of dynamic there where it's like, who the heck is this guy? Like this baby trying to collect rent from me? Oh uh, yeah. So no, not really as far as like dynamic wise. I mean, they're, they're all a little older. It's like, uh, like still a younger couple. I think they're like 27, 28. Um, so I mean, they're, they're good people. I mean, I kind of like joke with myself that sometimes I put on kind of like my landlord hat. Uh, and then sometimes I have kind of like my tenant kind of renter hat, like, Oh, I just kind of live here, but obviously like, you know, I, I fix stuff too. And I just kind of, try to separate it like a little bit, I guess. But yeah, I mean, really friendly people haven't had uh, really, really any issues. Um, but yeah, I, I could see that kind of for some people, I, I don't know, like kind of some sort of like learning curve or kind of like uh barrier dynamic or kind of presenting yourself to like other, other people as kind of someone who's younger. Awesome. And how did you screen these tenants? Yeah, definitely. So I used uh rent ready. Um, so the platform rent ready they do like the standard background check and, and credit check. So that was a good process. I mean, I had like my rough criteria of like their, their monthly income, like three times the rent, uh, rental expense. And also I think like credit score over like 650. Uh, and then, yeah, so I, you send them uh, like the link on rent ready. I think they pay like 20, $30. And then you get the results on kind of their, their background check and uh, their credit score. Um, so yeah, it worked out pretty smoothly. How do you, do you use a pricing manager for the Airbnb? Yeah. Price, price labs. Yeah. Cool. Uh, and then I guess one last question on these tenants is how did you go about finding them? Did you just put a listing up kind of everywhere or did you use a property manager or a real estate agent or how does, how does Chicago work? Yeah, I did it. I did it myself. Um, I put up the listings on, on Zillow and then also like I did kind of, I live in a kind of a high traffic area. Like there's a school, um, like a, a block or so away. So I just put up like the, the signs and kind of like my yard, like for rent, my number, put it on kind of like a couple street corners, like around here. So I think that helped like a little as well. Um, so yeah, I mean, I think it, as many places you can get it. Uh, but yeah, I mostly just Zillow and, and uh, the yard signs. Awesome. Yard signs. That's old school, man. It, and that it does that actually does work. Like I did that too on my first couple, and and I would get calls. I guess my question now is, what's next for you? So you got this house hack. It seems like it's pretty settled. Um, are are you you got your scouts set on number two? I think it's definitely nice to be kind of like settled now and have some more kind of time and like less pressure of like managing this large rehab and just kind of doing like normal like upkeep now. But obviously, still have some money to save towards to pay off these credit cards. And then also as far as like what I want to do next, yeah, it would be nice to buy like another multifamily, I think in Chicago. Uh, but I think going like the jump from like three and a half percent down uh, to like, I did find a lender that could do like 10% down on a multifamily like owner occupier. But yeah, I think like the, the FHA loan is just like such a gift mm -hmm. that I think it's kind of hard to, make that jump. So, I mean, we'll, we'll see what I can do. Maybe I can get like a JV partner, raise some capital, or, I mean, this isn't for, you know, six months from now. Um, but yeah, I mean, there's definitely opportunities, definitely want to grow and scale. 
Nice, man. Nice. Yeah, and you could always, have you ever thought about buying a single family home? Yeah, I mean, I, I, I thought about it. Just I, I've talked to like a few different lenders about it and it seems, I don't know, I'm sure you guys could have a take on it. Like once you go from like a multifamily to a single family, it might be harder to then tell your lender or your next lender that you're going from like a single family to a multifamily. Um, they might see it as kind of like a, a downgrade or something. I've, I've just heard from like a couple different like lenders. Hmm. Never heard that. I never heard that before. I know that I, I guess, yeah, my first one I bought was a multifamily and then I've bought single families ever since. Um, Cause I liked, I liked the way the single family payouts worked and stuff like that. But yeah, that's interesting. Maybe I'll have to buy another multifamily as a house hack. <laughs> yeah, give it a test. Awesome, Darren. Well, hey, this is uh, great stuff, man. I love your story. I kind of love how you're still pretty, you know, still pretty early on, still hungry to grow and scale. And I mean, you're doing it at such a young age too. You know, by the time you're the ripe age of 30, like me and Allie. Allie, how, I actually, I, I'm not supposed to ask a woman how old she is, but I don't even know how old Allie is, but I feel 32. like she's somewhere around 30. Okay, 32. Yeah. <laughs> I was trying to be a gentleman. Uh, the Thank you so much. <laughs> Once you're our ripe old age, you'll be... Uh, You'll be out there crushing it. We'll just have to remember who you are and uh, you'll have to remember us so that when you're on your yacht someday, you'll, you'll invite us. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I don't really have dreams about buying a yacht, but yeah, sure. We, we, we can hang out. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> awesome, man. Cool. Well, um, well, I guess, you know, with that being said, let's head into the final part of our show, which we lovingly call our final. final. The final four. four. Oh, Allie, kick us off. <laughs> Question number one. What are you reading right now, Darren? Yeah, definitely. I'm, I'm reading a book uh, called Nomad Capitalist. It's by Andrew Henderson. It's it's not real estate related. It's kind of more about like, I don't know, like geo arbitrage. And is there other countries that you could be living in or investing in? And what would be the benefit of that? So I, I kind of feeling a little bit of a travel bug right now with all these uh, credit card points from the rehab. Uh, so I, I, that's just kind of the rabbit hole I'm going down now. Where are you going? Like, what's what's the best spot? Can you, can you spill what you learned? Well, I think like going from the American dollar to, you know, anything less like like maybe like the the peso or Mexico, like anything that has kind of like where you know, you'd be spending less money or like your daughter would go farther in, in a different country. Um, so I think something like that. So I don't know, maybe spend some more time in Mexico or like South America or something like that. South America is awesome. Yeah. And I feel like everyone right now is going to Portugal. That's like the new thing. You know, I feel like last year was Puerto Rico. This year is Portugal. <laughs> oh man. Makes me want to go there too. Yeah. Awesome. All right, Darren. Uh, question number two is what is the best piece of advice you've ever received? Yeah, definitely. I, I was thinking about this. I have, I have just two of them um, that I would like to bring up. So one of them is stay humble and hustle. Uh, so that's one that kind of like stuck with me uh, as far as like kind of how to present yourself and, you know, how like your work ethic will kind of precede you. Uh, and then the other one is get comfortable being uncomfortable. Uh, it's just something I heard like first couple years of college, uh, I think like going to career fairs, just kind of putting yourself out there and just kind of uh, putting yourself in an opportunity where you can like improve your situation. The first, the first time I ever heard, I love that both those pieces of advice, but the second one uh, about being uncomfortable, like hit me hard. And the first time I ever heard that was in Tim Ferriss's book, the four hour work week, where he's like, your success is directly correlated to the amount of uncomfortable situations you put yourself in. And and so he would just like, you know, go lie like in the, in the grocery store, just go like lie down on the floor for like 30 seconds and like, or like, try to get like two girls numbers a day for like no reason whatsoever. Uh, and I just think that's such a huge, um, a huge thing. So love that. Yeah. Yeah. I like that a lot too. Actually the nomad capitalist, I haven't read that book, but I put it on my list. So thank you, Darren. It kind of seems like it's like the four hour work, pe work week 2.0, you know, cause like four hour work week touches on that a lot. So I like that. Question number three, what is your why? Why are you doing all this? Yeah, definitely. I mean, like, it, I, w I was trying to put together, like, some very well thought out answer for this. But honestly, like, just being at this age, being, you know, 23, I don't know what my life's going to look like, you know, and when I have a family of my own and, you know, yada, yada. Like, I, I don't know where I'm going to be living. I don't know what I'm going to be doing. But like, I can kind of see people, you know, uh, just, like, 
stuck kind of in like the the day job you know nothing against being like an employee for for a company like there's definitely benefits of that but just kind of seeing them you know having a commute to work having to worry about getting home by a certain time to like pick up their kids from school having like wanting to spend more time at home with their kids just kind of like all this stuff like i think being a parent and like having a family is like difficult enough so i would think having some sort of more flexibility and like time freedom when those opportunities like present themselves is just something that I'm like interested in. So, I mean, if I can put myself in like a better situation now, and then once I realize, you know, what I really want my life to look like, what I really want to be doing, uh, then I won't have kind of these, these barriers of like, Oh no, I can't. Cause I have to, you know, be in the office that, that day or, something like that. I love that. I love how much you're thinking ahead, you know, like for the family that you don't even have yet. So that's, that's great. Yes. Your, your future wife will thank you. The fourth question, have you ever stolen a candy bar from a corner store? (laughs) So specific. I don't, I don't think so. You know, I I really think I can say no to that one. Really? You are just a a saint, Darren. (laughs) Okay. What if it wasn't a candy bar? What if it was stolen anything from any store? (laughs) Maybe when I was like younger and didn't really understand that I had to like buy something. Uh, I don't know. I think it's just kind of something that came to mind is like, I don't know, like at the grocery store with your parents and you like put random stuff like in the cart and you just kind of like expect them to like buy it. Maybe something like that. But no, I, I don't really think I'm like <laughs> big, big into the thieving. <laughs> yeah, no, good for you. Not that, I, not that I was either. But there's two funny stories I can share. Um, it just brought up some memories when you were mentioning um, just when you were young, in the younger days. Uh, there was one time I was in, it was like, I was probably like five years old and I was in Blockbuster. If you guys remember what that store was. And, you know, you're like walking around looking at the movies and I, I got like a thing of Skittles and I've had one of those like sweatshirt pockets that was like a front pocket. And I put the Skittles in there fully expecting to pay, but we took so long that I forgot they were in my pocket. And then I just left. And I, on the way home, I was like, oh my gosh, dad, I have these Skittles and we didn't pay for them. We have to go back. And he's like, we're not going back to eat the Skittles. And I was like, oh my God, I stole something. So that was five-year-old me. And uh, I'm, I'm confessing now. So that's funny. Yeah, I actually, so I did not steal a candy bar from a corner store, but I did when I was uh, 12, I think I stole a bag of chips from a non-corner store and I got instant karma. And I was like, that that day I got karma. I forget what it was, but I just know I will never do that again. <laughs> it was like a bag of like sun chips or, you know, something like something that co- at the time cost like 25 cents. Not that that matters, but I was like, yeah, no. <laughs> oh my gosh. Yeah. Okay, one more, one more kind of a funny story. This was like, this was me being a juvenile delinquent. Like, I was in high school, probably hanging around the round crowd, and um, this 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 grocery store or this like convenience store was closing down, and it was our friend's dad who owned it. And so, as he was moving his goods from one store to the other, me and my friends backed up to the store in a truck and went in and just grabbed as much stuff as we could in like fifteen minutes. And threw it in the back of his truck. So we had like uh, probably like six months worth of like candy and chips and all that. And um, yeah, that was like the most exhilarating thing. We didn't, we never got caught. Hopefully I don't get in trouble for this now. It was like 15 years ago. And uh, and yeah, so yeah, that was my um, craziest probably like stealing story. Um, but now I buy everything. That's funny. <laughs> yep. I can't even go to Home Depot and like sneak a screw. So anyway. Now that we're not, we're all thieves except Darren here. It's okay, Darren. Don't don't let us peer pressure you. <laughs> don't steal. You made it this far. Um, uh, tell us here where can people find out more about you if they want to hear more about your story or follow along about where you're headed. Yeah, definitely. Um, I haven't really been on too much social media lately. Really, just on like LinkedIn. Uh, but I did just recently make an Instagram, uh, Darren underscore Burfield. Uh, so that's just kind of documenting some of my rehab process that I've done. Awesome, man. I saw you followed me uh, last night. I'm going to give you a follow right after this. Heck yeah. Awesome. Well, Darren, thanks so much for, for coming on the show, sharing your story. Um, again, super inspiring to hear someone so young getting started so so soon and also tackling such a big rehab and kind of how you went through that whole project. So Darren, thanks so much again, man. And uh, we'll be in touch for sure. Thanks for coming on, Darren. Yeah, definitely. Thanks so much. Thanks for your time. Appreciate it.
And that was Darren Bloomfield. Allie, what do you think about Darren? I loved it. I loved this episode. And there were a couple of quotes, uh, one that was aired and one that uh, he mentioned after we finished talking that I want to rehash again. Um, one was, he said it in the very beginning, where he said, it starts with first seeing yourself as an investor. And a lot of people, I feel like this, the community is kind of split between those that say or feel that they need to do, um, already purchase a property before they can call themselves an investor. Or the other half is like, hey, you know what? My mentality needs to change first. And then I can, the actions will come later. So that's like the category that he's in. And I, I loved it. Um, and then the other one was, he mentioned that it's all about momentum. And once you just start, you're going to continue going. So I love it. He started and he started off strong with the rehabs and everything. So I'm excited to see where he goes. 100% man. And I, I, sorry, I called you man. I call everybody man, but, um, I call you dude. Well, I call everyone dude. Call me you're dude. good. <laughs> yeah. Well, I am a dude, so it's okay. I guess you are a dude. <laughs> if you called me a woman, I'd be like, Ellie, what? <laughs> dude, uh, <Jet. laughs> yeah. <laughs> What's up, girl? Anyway, Darren is just like, you know, that second quote that Darren said, the, the momentum, I just think is so true. And I've just experienced that for myself too. Like I, I was fortunate enough to get able to get in pretty quick and pretty early. And I found that when I went to, I was going to meetups prior to buying my first property. And it was always like, am I a real person? Like, am I an investor? And then like, switching that train of thought, like his first advice, I am an investor. You go buy your first property. Now you can go to those meetups and talk about your problems and say, yeah, I bought one. Yeah, this is the cash flow. Yeah, this is it. And then ultimately people are going to start recognizing you as, as an investor. And that's just going to further your confidence, right? Like not that you should care what other people think, but ultimately like when you're in a situation, you want to be relatable. And I think that's huge. Yeah, absolutely. Then you have the track record to prove it. And you, once you've done one, especially if you're going to, if you're going to be doing a rehab, the rest will come easy. You know, like we talk about how it's, it's still kind of scary no matter what number property you're purchasing, but the first one is the hardest by far. It's the hardest. Once you get that over with, man, the rest will come so much easier. 100%. He, he, he made it over the first big hurdle and now it's going to be little hurdles and eventually he'll just be at a sprint from there. So, uh, awesome. Allie, anything else you want to say before we hop off for this week? If you enjoyed this episode, give Darren a follow. He mentioned his Instagram. Give us a follow. Reach out to him if you have any questions. Reach out to us and rate and review the podcast if you haven't done that already. Whether, you know, whichever platform you listen on, we would appreciate a review. Yes, I'm going to double down on what Ali said. Appreciate all the reviews. Appreciate the engagement. And so thank you all for listening this week. And until next week. We'll see you later. That's it for this episode of Investify. We hope that these nuggets of real estate wisdom lead to more savvy financial planning and a clearer path towards financial freedom. For more content like this, subscribe to the show at investify.com. Don't forget to leave a rating and share it with your friends. Together, we can transform more real estate newbies into successful and clever investors. Thank you so much for listening. See you on the next one.